Nebraska is rethinking how to respond when a juvenile gets into trouble. When does a young person deserve punishment? When should we be giving them help? That's next on Speaking of Nebraska. Welcome to Speaking of Nebraska. I'm Bill Kelly. We're here for another five weeks to talk about issues facing our state with some of the interesting people behind the headlines. There is a lot going on at the Nebraska legislature, so we'll bring you up to date later. And also a little bit of Nebraska history for you. Something significant has happened in Nebraska over the past 10 years. Fewer young people arrested, fewer in jail. The number of juveniles arrested since 2007 has dropped 41%. In the past 10 years, the population at the two youth rehabilitation and treatment centers dropped from a daily average of 550 juveniles in residence to just 178. For those young people who do get into trouble, the discussion with the judge is more likely to be about what can be done to help juveniles and families. The term in the judicial system is restorative justice. Deborah Denny and Alicia Jimenez are with the State Court Administrator's Office. They work with the state and county courts to change how Nebraska deals with its youngest offenders. I'm going to start, start with you, Deborah. When we use the term restorative justice, um, how does that fit into the court uh, administrator's office and, and the, the area that you work in? Sure. Well, Bill, restorative justice is, for me, it's best described as in contradistinction to retributive justice. So retribution, retributive justice is when law enforcement and the courts prosecute, in this case, a youth for an offense that they did, let's say a burglary or a vandalism. Um, the youth goes to court, they have the judge hears the evidence and makes a finding on whether the youth indeed committed that burglary. And if so, then the youth um, generally goes through the probation system and is on probation for a period of time. Um, that works well. We have a really robust juvenile probation office here in the state. Um, but one of the things that we are all working to enhance both probation and the rest of the state court administrator's office is to continue to reduce recidivism in youth. We don't want the young man or the young woman to commit another burglary in the future. We don't want them to commit another crime. The other thing we're trying to do with restorative justice is we're also wanting to bring the victim into the picture. So in the scenario where the youth um, burglarizes a home, um, in our current system, the victim typically is not involved. And in restorative justice, we um, have a, a three-prong approach. One, we want the offender, in this case the youth, to be held accountable to gain a sense of empathy. Two, we want to engage the victim if they choose, it's a voluntary thing, to help the victim feel like they're being made whole, to have a, a reparation or a restoration of however they were harmed, emotionally, financially, um, however they're harmed. And then third prong is we want, in restorative justice, the community to be safer, to feel safer. So for example, in this scenario, the homeowner's neighbors are also probably very much on edge that their neighbor got um, burglarized. And so by having a restorative justice conference, um, in this case, um, the project that my office, Office of Dispute Resolution is running, is called Victim Youth Conferencing where we bring together the young person who burglarized the house, the homeowner, and have a conference with a trained facilitator to provide an opportunity for the um, homeowner to tell how it affected them and for the youth to possibly give an apology and, and pay back a restitution. Why is that important for the young person? I mean, that's, that's a lot to put on a kid who's sometimes 13, 14, 15 years old, 
that they have never perhaps really taken on the consequences of, of their actions before. Right. Uh, what, what's that like for the, for the young people? It is, um, it's a very difficult challenge, obviously. And so that's why in Nebraska, we're very strong on following the best practices on how to approach a young person as well as a victim. So we have individuals that are trained facilitators that meet with the young person and most of the time their parents face to face privately. So we sit down and we say, tell us what happened. Um, we hear the youth story in private. And so at that first preparation meeting, they're not sitting across from the homeowner. So they have an opportunity to um, own up to what they did, to des describe why they decided to do the action, and to feel supported to um, eventually meet with the victim or a victim surrogate. Um, what we have found in evaluation, and, and Alicia is uh, an evaluator, has done evaluation of these kind of juvenile programs, is that youth who participate in this, they really gain a sense of empathy. They realize that their actions really hurt this other person that they're looking at eye to eye. And they feel a sense of um, contrition and um, they then are able to feel like, I'm not a bad person, I made a mistake. And I'm here to pay back my mistake. And, and I want to return to the process, but I want to, want to talk with Alicia a little bit. You do the number crunching in this, uh, <laughs> in this program these mm -hmm. days. Uh, what, what, uh, how do you describe the kids who are going through this process? What's the demographic makeup? What, what types of crimes are most common uh, that lead to this end of the process? Mm -hmm. And Deborah could interrupt me if I misspeak, but um, in terms of the types of offenses that um, tend to work with victim youth conferencing, you get a, they're victim crimes. So you get things such as theft or, um, um, per, as she mentioned in her example, burglary, assault, when we get recommendation, recommendations from the schools. Typically it's from youth who are in fights, so a mutual assault within the schools. Um, so be, there are offenses where someone was clearly impacted by that. Also in some of the offenses, it's the kind that really are impacting the community. So maybe that's graffiti or vandalism of some sort in the community, things along that nature. Um, and to clarify, there is a level of crime that we're talking about that this program would not be appropriate for, that there are still young people who, who face more serious charges who would not qualify for it. Right, right. This type of programming is part of, um, it's a type of diversion approach to juvenile justice. And um, the purpose of diversion and juvenile justice is really that um, the youth, um, as opposed to being formally processed in the court system, will be um, recommended to be a part of the diversion program. And diversion is an opportunity them for them to complete some conditions. And upon completion of those conditions that are satisfactory, then they won't have a formal adjudication um, as part of the diversion program. Um, it's also used, we receive some recommendations from um, probation, so those are children who've been adjudicated and it's part of the terms of their probation. And so um, because of that, you, it's really geared, usually the youth who are involved in di diversion um, tend to be youth who are lower risk offenders. So there are people who, as Deborah mentioned, they made a mistake or they had a lapse in judgment, but it's not that they're chronic offenders. And so this type of program is really geared towards the lower risk um, type of offender. So Deborah, the, the young person, the offender shows up in court, the judge is there, there has been a determination that diversion is appropriate in this case. Who else is involved in helping create this system that you set up well at the beginning? Um, 
the other people that are involved um, and before the youth gets to court are the county attorneys. The county attorneys are key people in the whole statewide diversion program. Um, the legislature a few years ago saw the value and the importance of actually um, appropriating, I think, close to $7 million to fund statewide diversion programs through each county's county attorney. And the reason for that is um, there's also been research that shows that once a youth, if you can keep youth out of the juvenile justice system, keep them out of the court, keep them out from before the judge, if you can get them early and have them go through this um, condition of meeting the victim and finding out how they've harmed someone else, where they learn from that experience, they feel a sense of cont contrition, possibly shame, but it's in a way that's more healing or restoring, that we're going to keep those children out of the school to prison pipeline. And we hear that language a lot, that once young people who make mistakes get into the juvenile justice system, they're at a higher risk for continuing in that justice system through adulthood. It's kind of like, I'm obviously I'm a bad person, I made a mistake, I'm now you know, going through the court system, I'm now on probation, and believe me, probation is working really hard to also reduce recidivism there, and I think they're doing a really good job. And yet there are those young people who say, I'm going to just throw it all out. I'm a bad person, and so I'm going to continue to be bad. Mm -hmm. This is a way to help change the behavior of young people who, who have made a mistake or poor judgment. Good. Alicia, this is a comparatively new approach. Still, what do the numbers show in Nebraska about recidivism, what they Mm -hmm. the, the term they use to say, are you going to get back in trouble again? Have you been arrested again? Right. So in the state of Nebraska, the Supreme Court has determined that recidivism is limited to whether or not a youth reoffends, um, whether it's anywhere from an infraction all the way up through a felony, whether they reoffend and um, within one year of successfully having completed whatever program they participated in. So the starting point is successful completion. And in probation, um, a report just came out earlier this year that um, the recidivism rate in probation is about 25.9%, which is actually pretty good considering um, the wide range of offenses that, are, that constitute a possibility for um, fitting within that definition of recidivism. So about a quarter of them will reoffend Within one year. Now, it's important to keep in mind, however, as I mentioned, it's any offense that's not a, a traffic violation. So that could include something that's, on, that's really small um, up through something that's a very serious offense. So whether that be um, infract, infractions for juveniles are included in um, in recidivism, in calculations of recidivism. So as compared to, for instance, with adults, there's a much more narrowed type of offense. Um, they don't start, they start at a much smaller category of what constitutes recidivism. So 25%. So with kids, it's minor good. in possession, mm -hmm. it's uh, truancy, right. it could be a, stuff like that? Uh, mm -hmm. It could be something as simple as a curfew violation if that happens within one year of having successfully completed the program and the youth was formally adjudicated in some form, whether in the juvenile or the adult court, for that offense, then it will constitute recidivism. With these types of programs nationally, are there indications that, uh, since the Nebraska program is, is fairly new, are there indications that juveniles who are involved in this type of program are less likely to become adult offenders and get in trouble with the law? Um, I actually am not 100% um, aware of the longitudinal studies that have been done. There have been a number of meta-analyses that have been done looking at whether or not um, diversion programs and restorative justice programs function for juveniles for anywhere up to five-year windows of um, evaluating recidivism. However, I'm not sure. I haven't seen any meta-analyses or studies that have looked 
as far as from childhood up through adulthood. So I'm not sure if you've seen any studies like I, that. I haven't on that, but I do want to build on the 25% recidivism mm -hmm. for youth on probation because the pilot project that the mediation centers just completed on a specific, the victim youth conference, the face-to-face -face conference, um, that the youth, and I think it was around 100 youth, that our recidivism numbers are about 12%. So about half of what the youth on probation are. We're showing like only that four out of five kids that participate in victim youth conferencing don't recidivate for a year later. So we're showing really great success. Mm -hmm. And I think it is contributed based upon what I would call that relational nature where I as a youth have to meet face to face with the person that I harmed and own up to what I did and be accountable. And that that is what um, builds that sense of empathy and changes the behavior and the mindset of the youth mm -hmm. um, early on. And so and these, the, this is a US Department of Justice evidence-based program and Nebraska is working with University of Minnesota Center on Restorative Justice to implement this program and we're very happy to say that the Nebraska data reflects the national data which it really reduces that return to crime. We mentioned at the top of the program that there had been this significant reduction in juvenile arrests over the past 10 years or so, the number of, of uh, uh, stays at the youth regional uh, centers have dropped considerably. This program certainly can't, can't take credit for all of it because that's right. been going on for so long, but right. is that an indication of just how many moving parts there are in, in trying to reduce uh, the amount of uh, interface kids have with the law? Absolutely, Bill. There's lots of moving parts, and I have to, again, give a lot of credit to the state legislature and the state judicial branch for shifting the juvenile justice um, case management um, to the judicial branch who's worked under Chief Justice Hevikin and Ellen Brokowski to make that reduction happen. Um, Office of Dispute Resolution and the mediation centers, the county attorneys, judges, Crime Commission people, we're, we're all continuing to have to continue to build the bridge as we go forward. But as you say, that data shows some really significant progress in Nebraska. And for each of us that has teenage children in our family, to have this opportunity um, means a lot. We predicted this. We're, we're running out of time. Uh, I had a whole other page of questions to ask you, but I'd like to thank both of you for, for being here. Uh, Deborah Denny and Alicia Jimenez are with the State Court Administrator's Office. Uh, they both work with the uh, county and state government to, uh, to uh, how to deal with the state's youngest offenders. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you, Bill, for inviting thank us. You. Here are a couple of other stories that NET News will be fe featuring in the next few days. On Monday, NET Radio and our friends at Harvest Public Media, the local food industry is getting crowded, so businesses are getting creative to draw new customers. One community supported agriculture program in the Midwest specializes in seafood. I had a chance to talk with a Nebraska-born attorney who found herself temporarily assigned to President Trump's White House, needless to say. It's been an interesting few months for her. And Friday marks the 105th anniversary of the deadliest tornado outbreak in Nebraska history. Listen for Mike Tobias's story on the 1913 Easter Sunday tornadoes Friday on NET Radio and watch his documentary Devil Clouds Friday night at 7 and 11 Central on NET World. You can listen or read to all of our uh, signature stories on NET Radio or at netnebraska.org slash news and connect with NET News and our journalists on our Facebook and Twitter accounts as well. 
It's getting towards crunch time in the Nebraska legislature with a month left in this session. At the start of the year, the big questions were, as they usually are, about spending and taxes. This week, that all came full circle. Fred Knapp has been in the chamber for much of it. So let's start with the spending side. Uh, the budget has been issue number one this week. It has, and uh, it is stuck at the second round of debate. And the big issue is... Title 10 family planning funds, which actually come from the federal government. There's no state money involved. But Governor Ricketts proposed that it be uh, language be inserted into the budget to prohibit giving any of those funds to any organization that performs abortions or refers for abortions. This is targeted at Planned Parenthood, which is one of the grant recipients currently. These are Title X family planning, contraception, pap smears, that's the kind of services, not abortions. But because Planned Parenthood also performs abortions, there are those who say the money is fungible, we want to cut them out of any funding. They get about $268,000 out of the $1.7 million that uh, the state gets from federal Title X. So is this really unusual that that there would be that small a budget line item that uh, that would hold up this whole process? It is. Um, and uh, opponents of this language say this is what you get for trying to insert a social policy into the budget language. Uh, proponents say we are conforming ourselves with uh, federal regulations and uh, this is an expression of uh, Nebraska's being a pro-life state. That's the way the governor put it. Are there senators who would ordinarily be put on the pro-life side of the ledger who uh, are still in the column that would like this budget to be passed? Uh, yes, there are. And notable among them is Senator Bob Christ, a pro-life senator who is now running for the Democratic nomination for, uh, for governor. So... Uh, uh, he and a number of other people um, are saying this doesn't belong in the budget. And so it's kind of a game of political chicken at this point, because if they don't pass the budget, then we continue on with the budget that was passed last year before revenues dropped. And so there aren't the cuts that have been taking place, but there are also not additional funds for, for example, child welfare. So foster parents might not get paid if we revert to last year's budget. And is that really the only significant issue that's that's the the holding up the works at this point? Um, it's it's at the top of the list. Uh, usually there are a series of amendments filed to the budget, and uh, they get through the first one, and then they get on to the second one, and they can fight about uh, university budget cuts, for example. That one has already taken place. They decided not to cut the university further. But there are undoubtedly other items below the Planned Parenthood issue, and if the way things stand now, they're not going to get to them. Good. Uh, Governor Ricketts vetoed a bill just today. What happened? Uh, he vetoed uh, the um, provision uh, in a bill by uh, Senator McAllister that would enable people who have served their prison sentences to have those convictions set aside. Uh, that's not the same as a pardon. But it's, it's uh, as Senator McAllister describes it, it's kind of like having a judge give you the good housekeeping seal of approval. Okay, you've served your sentence, you've done your time, uh, now you're entitled to a certain restoration of rights, including uh, the ability to get federal student loans, for example. And this was considered one key in helping reduce the prison population that has been vexing the state of Nebraska for a long time. Well, it's... Uh, it's technically after somebody has gotten out of prison, but you could argue that uh, if you don't give people a chance to start over again, then they're more likely to reoffend and wind up back. So you could make that argument. The language that the governor was using in opposition was really harsh in saying that murderers and human traffickers would, uh, would be allowed to go free. What's Senator McAllister's response to that? Well, um, they're already free. They've served their sentence. And they have to apply to a judge to say, uh, I've done my time, I've, I've lived a good life. And, you know, if, if somebody is a murderer, they're presumably still in prison. But uh, if somebody uh, committed some other crime, uh, they would still have to convince a judge that, uh, that they deserved this set aside, this good housekeeping seal of approval. Good. We have about a minute left. Uh, the tax relief was going to be the other major agenda item. They really haven't gotten to it 
yet on a significant way? Are the clouds going to part and uh, are we going to see a tax relief package come out of this legislature? Well, uh, it has, the clouds have parted somewhat and it's now out of committee, so it'll be debated on the floor. But uh, once again, there are those who say this is too much. There are others who say this is not enough. There's an alternative that would increase sales taxes in order to relieve property taxes. And then there's the petition drive lurking out there that would just say, we're going to give you back half of what you paid in property taxes for schools, and we'll figure out how to pay for that later. Very good. Thank you for joining us. Uh, during the session, listen to Fred's daily legislative updates on NET Radio at 545 and 745 and at 545 p.m. And on our website at netnebraska.org slash news. Even if you really don't follow the Nebraska State Legislature, you know the name of Senator Ernie Chambers. The state's best known African-American lawmaker has a poster of Malcolm X in his office. He was born in Omaha as Malcolm Little, and he's the subject of this week's look back at Nebraska history. Malcolm Little was born in North Omaha in 1925. His father was a minister who helped create the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Under constant threat by white supremacists, the family's house was burned to the ground in 1925. That was the first of three homes Malcolm would lose to the torch. While serving time in prison, Malcolm became a self-educated activist. As a black nationalist, he changed his name to Malcolm X, speaking out for black self-determination through any means necessary. In 1964, he authored the autobiography of Malcolm X. Eventually, he embraced the nonviolent principles of Orthodox Islam and took the name El Haj Malik El Shabazz, urging peace, tolerance, and brotherhood until his assassination in 1965. While I have you here, if you are on Twitter, I would love to hear from you. What did you think about tonight's show? Or you can follow developments in the courts and legal system in the weeks to come. That's Bill Kelly underscore NET. That's all for this week's edition of Speaking of Nebraska. Next week, we'll talk about how trade policy impacts the state's economy. Grant Gerlach is the host. Thanks for joining us and good night.